All right, so today it's head injuries. All right, so we're going to talk about head and spinal. The, uh, has anybody seen a good head injury lately? Yes. Well, tell me about yours. She um, <clears throat> had a seizure, fell off a bank stool, and then hit her head on a granite countertop. And she had like a ginormous hematoma, her, like her whole forehead. Andy, were you on that one with me, or was it somebody else? Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Because we got her eyes, her she pupils were right different. Yeah. She didn't know where she was, didn't remember her husband's name. Like, oh, really? She was a bank teller, couldn't tell us how many quarters were in the dollar. Nothing. Wow. Lee, that's good confusion. The whole time, did anything get better? Or it got better a little bit. She might have been a little bit postictal, too, because she had a seizure. Like, she had known seizure disorder. Um, but she was still pretty confused by the time we got there. She, was, she knew at least who she was when we got to the hospital. But if cool. you're, so what, if you're going to give her a diagnosis, what was your clinical impression? Um, I think that she was uh, honestly a mix of the post and then she probably had, I don't know, because she was, she popped up. So it wasn't, I don't know if she fractured or anything like that because her eyes were still the same. She was... I think she, she ended up the unequal pupils for a little while too. Yeah. She had unequal pupils for a while. Mm -hmm. So maybe a concussion. Yeah. The uh, a lot of times when people are growing up this way, they say, "Oh, then the brain's fine." Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's better with, for it to grow out this way, right? Better than growing on the inside. Yeah. But we also have to worry about coup contra coup and the idea that they could have rattle their brain a little bit, which is basically a concussion. What, what kind of head injury did you have? Well, an old lady that fell in the morning and hit her head on the counter, and we got there, and it was pulsating bleeding out of her head, and it was like, this Oh, really? Yeah, and somehow she controlled the bleeding with, like, an old raggedy towel that they used for their, like, oven, so it worked great until we got there and took it off, and they were like, oh, we're going to put something right back on there. Wow. And then did you do a nice, sweet, remember how it came um, This was before that? that, but I wish. This is, like... A month or two ago. And it's, if that arterial bleed was squirting blood on the inside of her cranium, what would have you called that? Um, uh, hemorrhagic stroke, maybe. Hemorrhagic stroke? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, like when we think of arterial bleeding, we think of epidural bleed. So that would drive back. Epidural hematoma. Bleed. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So, do you want to give me one? Or I just, one. Go ahead. Um, I had a woman who was out drinking with her husband, and she was Ooh. drunk. And she got to the second step, walking into her house, and fell straight backwards out of the back of her head. Um, she was unconscious for a while and had decent bleeding. It was controlled when we got there. Um, but she had no idea what was going on. She was anal you know, times one, and she had bilateral head bleed. Oh, really? Yeah. And do you know, was it subdural then? I think it was subdural. Subdural? That sounds yeah. like that mechanism is usually subdural. Yeah. But a good one. Yeah. You know. Did you have one too, Ed? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> have you seen the movie Fifty First Dates? The woman in there? Yeah. Yeah. We had a patient like that. The woman in there. What's her name? Halle Berry. No. It's not Halle Berry. <laughs> <laughs> Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore. Uh, there you just go. a Berry, right? <laughs> A very angry. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> kind of the same instance, except he had a lot shorter of a cycle. So he had a cycle of like about four phrases. He'd say, What happened? How where's the blue bridge? Oh, perfect. Was I riding a scooter? And then he had like one more. He'd get through those and then be like and then move and touch his head and be like, My head hurts. What happened? Yeah. Sort of situation. And he basically huh. just fell off a scooter. Uh, those are all I love those. Like just repeat your question. They usually do. And it'll be the same way. It'll be the same thing. Like, oh, how about this? How about that? You feel like writing down the answers and say, just refer to this piece of paper for me. Oh, wow. <laughs> so head trauma, let's start with some A and P stuff. You need, you need to know this kind of who ya. The other the last time we did this, we talked about and I had a slide that showed that uh, artery. What was the name of that artery that went right back here? It's, it would have been awesome if they called it the temporal artery. That's what a lot of people would call it. But it was something else, and it was above the dura. It was called the middle meningeal artery. So middle meningeal makes it sound like it's in between, like right? middle meningeal. It's in between the meninges. But the middle meningeal artery is this one that is often the culprit for epidural bleeds. 
So the uh, these are all kind of easy that we have a big old scalp up here and some tissue in between there and the skull is nice and thick here. And then dura mater is on the outside. The dura mater is tough, fibrous. Uh, what is dura mater in Latin? Not Latin. What is dura mater in German? Tough mother. Tough mother. All right. So that's Latin. So uh, tough mother. Arachnoid, they call it that because it looks like a spider web. And then the pia mater is much more like saran wrap, all right? And it just adheres to the brain then. Um, the, uh, not much that you have to know about that, but look at, like, uh, it's going to be a quiz question. It's not going to be a test question. Too easy for that. So dap or pad, you can always make a letter. I mean, a word out of the letters, all right? Dap or pad. So the arachnoid has to be in the middle. It makes sense that the dura mater is on the outside. It's the tough mother protecting everyone else, right? And so what, this is, goes way back. We've seen this one back in preparatory, <laughs> and we've seen this area in medical emergencies one. What is that area called? Bronchus. No. Wernicke's. Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> so bronchus area is there. Wernicke's is back there. This is the frontal brain. What is that? It's Enzyme Strip. Toledo. Tobido. Is that what you said? Toledo. Toledo Strip. <laughs> Are you thinking of the Cleveland Flats? Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's the motor strip. Your, your, then remember, Broca's area was motor. It was producing speech. This is where the um, nerves begin to say, go do this with your muscles. Motor strip. They originate there. And then this one is going to be the what strip? Opposite of motor is? Sensory strip. Sensory strip. And now we're then back in the parietal area. And so parietal is all about sensory and understanding what we're touching. And when we're talking, that's, all, that's it for A and P. All right, for the brain, you, I, that, this, is, uh, this represents the erasing of about 10 slides. <laughs> all right, so probably two years ago. Um, you, you still need to know all of those slides that we covered in A&P for neurology. All of that stuff is still important, but you know that. And I didn't want to bore you with going over that again. Um, and then the primary brain injury is the injury to the brain that's really associated with the, the actual damage that occurred right from the get-go, all right? Like the knife coming into the skull. That's primary, right? is what happened right away, all right? So when we do coup contra coup, a lot of people get this confused. That's, you have to throw coup contra coup in there to make it confusing. Coup contra coup is when you hit here, right? Boom, and you have damage to the front of your brain, but then your brain goes to the back and gets damaged there. Both of those are primary, all right? That happened at the incident, boom, it happened. Secondary, is the after effects, all right? So what do you think causes secondary brain injuries? Bleeds or like Bleeds. Just the jostling of, like if somebody has um, a concussion, let's say like the, the, that movement of the brain can cause issues. Yeah. It's like confusion, brain fog, that kind of stuff. And they walk on traffic? <laughs> what else, bleeding, what else? Infection, edema, like edema, edema, swelling. What was that one? The visual dilation. Those things. Increased ICP. <coughs> Any other ones? Um, people That's not an injury, though. It could lead to them walking on traffic, I guess. So um, here we are. Hypoxia. Just hypoxia because they're not breathing well. Hypoxia is going to lead to ischemic. Ischemic infarcting, infarcting, infarct death. Uh, bleeding and then hypotension, two down, like two more down. Hypotension, so you don't perfuse the brain, then you're going to have an injury that way. And why do you have hypotension? Is because of whatever reason we can think of. And then uh, just an occlusion of the artery, all right? Just an occlusion, which can happen traumatically also. Most common cause, traumatic brain injury, it says there the most common cause is a motor vehicle accident. 
guess what? Probably not true. Forgot to change that. It used to be true. All right. So it was true in 2013. <laughs> it was probably true in the 2017 or so when they actually produced the thing before your book. Um, in your book, it probably has the correct number one reason. Why do you think? What is the number one reason now? Falls. Falls. Yep. Falls striking your head. Um, motor vehicle accidents is just the how we've built up the safety stuff um, is becoming less and less of a problem. And where more and more people are dying of traumatic brain injuries are old people and people where we've got a lot more of those um, anticoagulant medications. So we have more deaths from, or brain injuries, not deaths, uh, brain injuries from falls. And then the skull fracture. So we're gonna go over the different skull fractures. We touched on this before, right? So here we have just a linear skull fracture. 80% um, of the fractures or skull fractures that we'll come across would be linear skull fractures. They're hard to diagnose pre-hospital. We probably are never gonna diagnose them. We're gonna say, ooh, that was enough to crack your skull. So we're gonna maybe treat them that way, but it's not something we can palpate. We're probably not gonna feel crepitus. None of those things. We're just gonna say, wow, you probably have a skull fracture because that's what happens when you get hit with a bat in your head like that. The next one is a depressed skull fracture, and this is one. This is now a comminuted fracture, so it's going to be more than one place. And now when we are pushing on the skull, uh, probably not in a purposeful way, but possibly, we're going to feel that there is an indentation there. High energy, very specific trauma to one part of the head. So we don't get a lot of these fractures from motor vehicle accidents, right? It really has to be, if it's in the motor vehicle accident, you have to be able to also say, wow, on top of it just being a motor vehicle accident, the bumper hit that guy right in the head because it's just a, a you know, big truck against a old Honda Civic or something like that and ran it right into his head. Uh, when we're talking about falls, I guess it's possible, but that's a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to fracture your head like that. So it's probably a fall from distance. And then the other one is uh, getting in fights, all right? And then it's not, someone usually doesn't give somebody a comminuted fracture of their skull with a fist, all right? It's gonna probably be something that they're swinging and hard and it hits them like a bat or what you'd like think of medieval mace or whatever it would be. And then a basilar skull fracture here is the base. Basilar is the base of the skull. So again, you're not going to be able to feel it. You're not going to have any signs when it just happened. The way we pick these up are on the MRIs and x-rays. And then the way we might see it four hours after it happened or let's just say hours after it happened. Oh, I guess it doesn't have to be hours. Like if they're just cerebrospinal fluid flowing out of their ear, cerebrospinal fluid flowing out of their nose or in, into their mouth, all of those would be indications that they have a basal or skull fracture. Otherwise, we're going to have to wait for raccoon's eyes and battle signs. That one, those are the ones that are hours away. What is the trick for cerebrospinal fluid? How do we know that it's cerebrospinal halo. fluid? Halo. Halo. A halo on a four by four. But I think the best way to do it is maybe the, the paper that the four by four came in, all right? That's non-absorbent. I think that's that will do it better than a four by four. Does anybody have an argument against that? So I think it's that, that paper works better, faster, where we would be able to see it. And we don't manipulate the patient in a way that we could do that, like here, move your pour some of this out. Um, it's not that big of a deal. If there's free flow of blood or out of the nose, like we get hit here, bam, free flow of blood coming out of the nose, it's cerebrospinal fluid. You don't, you don't have to check it with your glucometer or anything like that. Same thing, we got boom, we're over here, all right, so here, and now they have uh, blood coming out of their ear. Um, we have to just say, wow, that could be a basal skull fracture, we're a priority one. 
And then an open skull fracture, pretty easy. You're gonna see, um, you don't have to see brain tissue for it to be one, but you're probably, in our being paramedic students, probably gonna say something like possible brain tissue or gray matter. A high mortality, now we're also dealing with infection and all of that. It took a lot of uh, energy to get that to, to happen. Any questions about skull fractures? So the next one is a DAI, diffuse axonal injury. And so it's associated, uh, it says similar to concussion. And if you look in some books, concussion will be under the heading DAI, all right? A concussion is a DAI. When you have a concussion, what has happened is you had, all you have to do is watch a movie to know this, you know, like, Will Smith knows this stuff, <laughs> all right? You have, in, in a concussion, what you did was you stretched or sheared your axon, all right? And that is in a small way. So it isn't in a way that you can pick it up on an MRI, let alone a CT, and absolutely not on an X-ray. At a mic, an axon, so we're talking about microscopic, right? We're talking about the small nerve cells and the axon. So you have axonal damage. That's where it's at. That's when the dendrites and the axons come together. That's not working anymore. So you're concussed. A mild DAI is a concussion. That's a great way to think about it. A moderate DAI is worse than a concussion. <laughs> All right. A severe DAI is usually explained as the person got hit in the head and didn't wake up. They're in a coma for the rest of their life. A severe DAI is high. You know, that means they didn't have an epidural bleed, they didn't have a subdural bleed, they didn't have anything that is picked up on MRI or CT or X-ray, yet they don't wake up. They, they don't wake up, and that's severe, all right? So, and there is people like in hospitals that, that usually is, you know, the, they have a neurologist, they're coma for a while, they might get better, but after a couple of years, they usually say, it's time to start thinking about pulling the plug and such. Is that severe DAI, DAI are the ones where you hear like somebody was in a coma for three years or something and all of a sudden got better. That's because our body does have the ability to re-engage those things, right? That's why we keep them, you know, sometimes around ventilators and all of that for a long period of time. The class spaces What's that? The class symptom is what moves you into the different classifications. Yeah, I don't think, like when I think of that, Think of the DAI altogether and what our, again, we're going to do it, paramedic student stuff. A mild DAI associated with a concussion. All right, so uh, pretty easy that way. I don't think the National Registry is going to use the term DAI. Like, uh, and if they do, it will be in an easy question. All right, um, it is hard to, it, there isn't a good set list for me to give you mild, severe, mild to moderate severe. The moderate would be the, would be the hard ones. It would be like, who here has been concussed? So we all should get concussed by some time, all right? You live your life, all right? So <laughs> yes. the uh, concussion is like, uh, I've been to the hospital twice for concussions, and I probably should have gone five times or so. Um, when you're concussed, both the, the two times that I went, was, went to the hospital was when I was a kid. Um, who, who, again, it's just you two. So when when you went, uh, what hospital did you go to? St. Mary's. And how long were you at St. Mary's? Um, a day. Two did days. you spend the night? Uh, I also went to DeVos when I was younger, younger. But the most recent one was St. Mary's. All right. Uh, at DeVos, I was there for two days. Two days? Yeah, I lost consciousness on the playground. Very often, a concussion begins with a loss of consciousness. You don't have to have a loss of consciousness with a concussion. So mild DAI doesn't have to have a loss of consciousness. Um, and then you're confused. How, how young were you the first time at Devos? Third grade, so eight maybe. All right. 
knocked out, went there, spent a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Do you know, did you have any edema? Did they say anything like that? Uh, I wish I could remember my <laughs> eight-year-old <laughs> years that well, but, you know, uh, uh, I was brought in by EMS, which that was my first experience with EMS, actually. Um, that was back when we had the padded uh, headboards, which were really comfortable, surprisingly. Oh, all right. Um, I, I, that's my two days. <laughs> I, I, I would assume I did, because I was there for a good chunk of time. Um, but I, I can't tell you for sure. How about you, Andrew? What was yours like? Uh, I fell six feet to the back of my head uh, on concrete. So mine more ended in, like, they didn't even check it out, because my heart rate when I woke up from losing consciousness was about 38. So I had a basal vagal felt. Um, and then all my symptoms just kind of reared after the fact because that kind of ended up in a, like a post-concussive PTSD type situation. Hmm. So at the same, you said same right? Uh, I went to Mercy of Mesquite. Mercy. And then how long were you there? Hours. Hours. And so the norm, and it was true for both of mine, we're there for hours, like waiting room and such. Uh, I got CAT scanned one time. And then, that might be a lie. I didn't get CAT scan. I got x ray once. Um, and that was, I, I go to Zealand Hospital. They don't have CAT scans. That's why it's a lie. Um, and, but, I, but I went through more procedures with that one. The other one, they were like, all right, here's your pamphlet. <laughs> go home. Uh, so they give you a pamphlet. And what does the pamphlet say, do you think? Don't do anything. Don't get a concussion again for at least a week. <laughs> they didn't care in the 80s. They didn't care if it was a week or the 70s and 80s. They're like, they didn't realize after a concussion, your brain is more vulnerable because those things are separated. They'll separate more permanently if you get your bell rung again. It basically says you can go home, have somebody wake you up, don't sleep for a long periods of time. And it sounds like sleep is bad, but they want you to, they're like, not sure if you're a concussion yet. Because nothing shows up on a concussion. Like you, um, if you're edema, edema could, edema takes a while. So if they send you home, you could have cerebral edema, and that concussion look will stay longer. And so you'll go to sleep and you won't wake up for a long time. They would just as soon your mom wake you up every two minutes, make sure you understand A and O times four, and go back to sleep. All right. And it says if you get worse, come back. If you uh, have a bad headache, if you lose consciousness, if you have all of what we're going to list as the signs of intracranial pressure, come back. All right, come back. And one time when I was there, most of the time was sitting in the waiting room, <laughs> going back, just to talk. The doctor, I, I, you know, I, these are when I was pretty young, so I don't have that big of a recollection. Um, and then go home. And then after that, I was like, I'm never going to the hospital for concussions anymore. <laughs> so the uh, concussions there's nothing that we do for them and we just protect your head for now it's like two weeks both military and uh nfl and college football it's all like protect your head for two weeks because you get another big old bang on your head those things that are fragile now are going to maybe permanently come apart so the next one we got these these are the things um, confusion, disorientation, loss of consciousness is usually it has a loss of consciousness, but you don't have to have a loss of consciousness. What's retrograde amnesia? We're going to have to compare it to anterograde. So what happened leading up to? Retro event. is leading up to. Everybody, who you on that? Do how do you remember that? How do you remember retrograde is leading up to? Retro is the past, like retro nights at. The intersection is the past, it's the 80s, all right? And then anterograde, what, like, um, anterograde, what, how would we diagnose anterograde amnesia? Do you remember what happened after the concussion? Yeah, and we, and, and you're anything. not building memories now. They keep repeating those questions. Exactly, that's anterograde amnesia. So you can go in further when you have the patient that Andrew was explaining and say, well, let's talk about earlier today and see if they remember, oh yeah, uh, I had bologna sandwich or whatever. And then you can write and you can communicate. No retrograde intubation from what I can, no retrograde intubation, <laughs> no retrograde amnesia from what I can tell. He's able to answer questions about this afternoon, but he has some anterograde amnesia 
He's not building new memories because I've answered the same questions over and over again. And that, look, at it's concussion. So it doesn't mean the person's going to die or anything like that. You can, it's a great thing to say to the other people who are family members and friends who are also answering those questions before we got there and listening to, oh, he's, you know, like Gilligan's Island amnesia. Does he even remember who I am? Um, the, uh, you can say that is very normal. But not being able to build memories right away is, is normal. Now, the next thing would be a cerebral contusion. And now a cerebral contusion, so since when we think of this as a contusion and we talk about that being minor blood vessels giving you a bruise and such, you really start to think, all right, so this is bleeding in the brain. But we kind of have to stay, you know, go away from that and think of this as swelling of the brain tissue. Less about breakage of small blood vessels in the cranium, more about swelling of the brain. And again, when you are, and that swelling of the brain takes a while. So if you go to the hospital right after the thing, boom, you're just concussed, looks like you're concussed. We're not gonna do an X-ray. We're not gonna do a CT, because the CT is just, you know, that's defensive medicine. Um, some people like defensive medicine and they'll do that, but it's not gonna find anything. And it wouldn't find anything. And the cerebral contusion, very often, they don't find that either, if we're doing it within hours of the, of the problem. But the tissue can, you know, slowly get bigger and bigger. And later on, you can end up having ICP, all right? And you can have a little bit of a push to your brain one side or the other, all right? Uh, when we're in this contusion area, it's usually not something that we're talking about big, you know, they're getting, you know, like 17 percent death rate or whatever. It's usually just that longer period of time where you have an anterograde amnesia, you have bad headaches, photophobia, all of those signs that we saw as concussion signs. That greater neurological deficits would be things like a longer period of time, but it also could be things like your pupils, that kind of thing where your pupils are unequal and uh, maybe not tracking the same way quite as with, uh, the way they should. And then, everybody good with those? So the next, th there's really, um, let's get DAI out, all right? Three things to remember. Concussion, contusion, easy ones, and then bleeds, all right? So our hematomas, our bleeds. And so here, we're really going to have epidural and subdural, which we all know that's EMT stuff. And then I don't know if I have slides about intracerebral, uh, it would be the next one. So when we're talking about those, we, we, it's not like the blood loss is so bad that we're going to bleed to death. The blood loss is bad and it leads to this intracranial pressure. Way more concussion doesn't have it, right? There's no swelling with a concussion. Contusion has has the potential at least increase intracranial pressure, all right? But not in a way that's going to push our brain stem to the form and a magnum, our form and magnum. So accumulation of blood within the skull, swelling of the brain is also going to happen. So we have that CPP equals MAP minus ICP. So we're going to skip doing a whole bunch of math. Okay with that? Tiffany? Yes. So the, uh, uh, we have to be good at doing these. You know, this 100% is National Register kind of stuff. Now, this, it frustrates some people because we don't get this number anyways, right? But the, what they want you to do is understand the concept of it, all right? So the uh, so they will ask questions just like we had on a, on a quiz question. Even though it's not like reality, you have ice, you know, you're going to drop a bolt in the person's head and, and figure out their ICP. The things that cause increased ICP, swelling, swelling of the brain, that is, bleeding, and then cerebral spinal fluid accumulation, that's kind of a pediatric thing when they have hydrocephalus. As ICP increases, everything in the skull is compressed. All right, so when we're bleeding outside of our brain, and we now have more stuff than what we want in that cranial vault, our vessels will be compressed, our cerebral spinal fluid will start to get compressed, and our brain are compressed. We can displace a little bit of blood, all right? We do that, and generally, we 
don't, I'm going to hope this makes sense, but we talk about vasoconstriction and vasodilation a bit. We don't really change the arterial side. The brain doesn't like that idea of getting a big vasodilation or vasoconstriction on the arterial side because he wants the arteries, he wants the oxygen and sugar to come up. But there is some venous side, all right? So we will start to squeeze down on the venous side, which is going to really increase our pressure, over our blood pressure that we can assess on the arm. And we can also make it so we're not gonna create as much cerebrospinal fluid and we can, or already, always, I should say, making cerebrospinal fluid and, and uh, getting rid of it, reuptaking it, making more, and reuptaking it, making more. And we are, we're gonna end up displacing a small amount of cerebrospinal fluid. But we can only do so much of that. At some point, you have, have decreased perfusion of the brain. And then this would be called a um, central nervous system ischemic response. Central nervous system is our brain, right? Brain and spinal cord, right? So the central nervous system ischemic response is what's going to come up next. The brain does not like the idea of not getting its blood. And if you have increased intracranial pressure, fluid will always flow through the path of least resistance. You're going to have less blood flow going up there. So um, we're going to end up looking at these two things here. If the person has hypercarbia, and you get that through hypoventilation, that causes cerebral vasodilation. If the person is hypoventilating, then let's go and begin in your mind's eye, go back to the respiratory chapter, I believe. Um, it talks about the different respiratory um, the patterns that we can have. And so um, can you name a respiratory pattern that we've learned so far, Tyler? Chain Stokes. Chain Stokes. Give me another one. Uh, Biots. Biots. Michael? Agonal. Agonal. Good. Agonal. Michaela? Rebecca? Who's Oh, come on. It really was. That was also mine, actually. <laughs> right. and there's apneustic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And central nervous system hyperventilation syndrome, which kind of looks like who's So, hyperventilation. Yeah. So, central nervous system hyperventilation. No syndrome. In there. Um, so, chain stokes, biots, apneustic, central nervous system hyperventilation. All of those are caused by intracranial pressure. All right. Um, the, uh, there's probably another one in there too. So when we are, and those are hypoventilating, right? They very often have periods of apnea in there, whether there's a crescendo or not. So when that is happening, um, it says it results in increased blood volume, which may, might make the brain happy at first, but it's going to increase the ICP and that's going to decrease CPP then. All right, which is cerebral perfusion pressure. Remember, that was uh, MAP minus ICP, right? So hypotension results in decreased CPP and cerebral vasodilation. So if we have low blood pressure, that's bad also. And then hypotension uh, results in increased blood volume. ICP goes up and then the CPP goes down. There's no real good way to treat the brain. There's no real good things for the brain to do by itself to improve things when you're bleeding into the cranium. As ICP goes up, cerebral blood flow goes down. That's the easy one, right? As ICP goes up, cerebral perfusion goes down. That's a decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure. Compensatory mechanism is we increase MAP. What do we do? We increase blood pressure. We're going to do that with our sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system, when we engage the sympathetic nervous system, we usually talk about vasoconstriction. 
but that causes vasodilation in our brain, vasodilation in our lungs, and vasodilation in our big muscles, and, our, and the muscle, really important muscle, is our, is our heart. So when we're doing all of that, that's going to increase intracranial pressure. So because we increase the size of the vessels and we have an increased pressure, so when we're doing that, we're going to spill out more blood, which is going to increase how much stuff is on the outside of the brain. This is the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. All right, so we talked about this right before, right? Named after one of Charlie's angels, um, which was Kelly Monroe. The brain picks, takes up 80% of the cranial vault, all right? 10% is circulation and 10% is cerebrospinal fluid. When our brain starts to swell, we're gonna to start to push out a little bit of the cerebrospinal fluid and the, and the circulation, and then we're gonna start pushing brain through the form and magnum. When we're taught, when we're in this discussion, then we're kind of this is the circling the drain. All right. So whether we're trying to help the patient or the patient is doing their own thing, um, we can start anywhere on here. And when we have increased brain edema, that's going to be increased tissue pressure. It's going to increase intracranial pressure, decrease cerebral perfusion pressure, decrease cerebral blood flow. That's going to increase ischemia ischemic pressure, ischemic brain is going to swell and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. You can start anywhere, they, they feed on each other. So that's why there's kind of a high mortality rate for severe head injuries. <clears throat> Clinical effects then that we're going to see when somebody has an increased intracranial pressure. First of all, it's all the things that we mentioned with concussion and contusion. The cerebral cortex and the RAS. What is RAS? Particular. Active fatality system. System. All right. So the RAS, reticular activating system, that's what gives us our level of consciousness. All right. That's what we manipulate to put people to sleep. That's like when people have a problem with it when they have like uh, they just go to sleep on an accident. That's a problem with your reticular activating system. Drugs mess with that. They can stimulate it so you don't go to sleep ever. Make it so you go to sleep inappropriately. So uh, the hypothalamus then is going to give you your vomiting. Pressure exerted down on the brain. So it doesn't matter where the where the hemorrhage is. It doesn't have to be on the top of your head can be here. The brain only has one way to go, and that's down through the foramen and magnum. So the brain's direction is going to be traveling down. It may, as we look at CAT scans, we'll see it move to one side or the other as blood is pushing it over. But where the problem is, is it's, it's being exerted down. And underneath there is where all your cranial nerves and your pons and medulla are. That's why we have all the messed up um, respiratory things, is because you're Medulla is in charge of that, and it doesn't do well when it's getting rubbed against the bone. So increased blood pressure, force into the brain against increased intracranial pressure. Bradycardia is secondary to the vagal stimulation. So when we're in Cushing's reflex now, we have increased blood pressure and decreased pulse. Irregular respirations, all the ones that I mentioned. Apneustic breathing. What do you think, how would you describe apneustic breathing? What do you think is, what do you think is uh, being assaulted when you have apneustic breathing? What's that? Your apneustic center. <laughs> apneustic breathing is when your apneustic center has been infringed upon, all right? And your apneustic center Oh, this is a good one for Tiffany. Oh. What does your apneustic center do? Or makes you breathe. If you, it makes you breathe. It's like makes if you, you breathe? stop breathing, it's like it stimulates you to breathe again, right? Like Apnea means breathe. Apnea, Apnea means the absence of breathing, but doesn't your apneustic center do the opposite of that? If you're not breathing, it's like, Seems hey, you like should a probably weird breathe. thing to call it. I thought it was, I could be wrong. Well, come on, let's have some confidence. <laughs> what is the other you did do? Um, where, where, where is this located? One word. Central nervous system. 
Brain. Those are three words. Those are two words. Three words. Brain. That was a good one. <laughs> this one is the palms. And so there was two things that helped our breathing. Uh, there was the apneustic center and the what? It had new in it. New. new. Taxic. Good job, Michaela. Did you get that one? Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Nice soft voice there. So <laughs> the, uh, these two are secondary things, just like Tiffany School does sound. All right. Medulla has primary. Yes. That, so that's where the primary initiation for breathing comes from. And then we go now this one, if you are ataxic, if someone has an ataxic gait, what's the what is their problem? They're not walking evenly. evenly. So pneumotaxic center is for even respirations. All right. So when we are breathing, remember medulla says breathe, 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 breathe. We stretch. We send up a message back up, and we say we stretched enough. That goes through the pneumotaxic center. Pneumotaxic center says stop breathing. All right. So the way they say this is inhibits. All right. So it's inhibitory. This one, again, as we were schooled, crappy term. It should be called the noustic. <laughs> they like apneustic. They probably figured it sounded better. But this one is excitatory. This one says breathe when we didn't breathe when we were supposed to breathe. So when we have apneustic breathing, what you'll see is your thing, the patient is exhaling and they start breathing in again. Like, it wasn't time for you to breathe in, in again. The pneumo, the apneustic center is kicking in before it's supposed to. All right. And it's doing that because it's irritated from pressure and it's that pressure is pushing the brain down against the bottom of the skull. So this is a good way just to bring up in conversation <laughs> these two things all right pneumotaxic smoothness of respirations or ventilatory quality apneustic is the is the uh you know secondary thing and the way it works is it basically just says to the medulla hey wake up hey breathe all right and so with apneustic breathing they're exhaling and they're breathing up so you're like that was not a long exhalation it's one of those things that are fairly difficult to see unless they're breathing fast. All right, then you can, then you're like, oh, this is, I figured it out. That's what they're doing. You might be able to pick it up on cap, the way your capnography looks. In the lecture on that, it said that it was similar to like Kuzmal respirations without the acetone breath. Like that's the way that they put it. <coughs> no, the like central nervous system is, but Kuzmal is just fast and so that's more like just hyperventilation or hyper tachypnea, right? So um, it is sort of like chain stokes, um, sort of like biots. Um, ataxic breathing was the other one that's just like biots. But apneustic is kind of all by itself that way. Something that I wouldn't, I would not expect you to pick up chain stokes. Unless somebody says, hey, yes, change folks. <laughs> it's a hard one to really pick up if they have normal respiratory. You know, you're going to pick up the apneas, but for them to watch, watch their increase in X. And then, you know, change folks is supposed to be crescendo. It's hard to pick up when you're doing all, you know, you should be taking care of your patient, not just walking their breathing for a long time. And by us, we just don't, we like, this guy needs to be in it. You know, like we just pick it up and we don't pay that much attention to it. This guy, you might be able to see it because he's like, almost looks like a hiccup sometimes because he's just, <gasps> and he's breathing in again. And, and that's like, irregular, or is it irregular? irregular probably. So whatever. Yep. Um, and then, so when we're talking about this guy who has all of these things, and this is as it gets worse, now we're gonna end up with cranial nerve problems. Cranial nerve number three, what's the name of that one? Oculomotor, that's going to give you your blown pupil. You're going to have your abnormal posturing, like, what do we call flexion one? Decorticate, Decorticate and decerebra. Seizures, and then, then you're going to be herniating your brain. All right? So that's getting worse as we go.
down there. Here's our uh, look of decorticate and decerebrate. Early signs of that intracranial pressure, vomiting, headache, altered LOC, uh, you know, boom, that concussion, 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 right? You shouldn't seize with a concussion. Um, you know, your cerebral edema, like from the contusion, that could that could give you a seizure. All right. Um, and then ominous signs, these guys. And I usually say, I've said before, is when you are dealing with blown pupils and these uh, things, that person is probably dead. All right. They're probably going to donate their organs. They're a great person to donate their organs. Um, and maybe, you know, that's, I don't think that's a, something you should say right away, like, hey, does he donate his organs? And, but it is something that you might want to say to family, this is about as bad as it gets, all right? So they're warned maybe a little bit before, like, oh, things are going to be okay. This is bad. But I've also seen these, like our at AMR, we have um, Tim Hoffman. Tim Hoffman had this kind of stuff, all right? Like uh, bad pupils and seizing, and he's doing all right, all right? So you can. And I also I very often say kids do better than adults, all right? Kids can bounce back from these. When I hit my head in the playground, I said I was having like seizure-ish activity after the fact. I, again, don't remember any of this, but. <laughs> yeah, and that seizure activity can be very, like uh, one of those seizures, like when people pass out when they get their blood drawn, they can have a little seizure type of thing from hypoxic brain. But it's scary for like when you're looking at decorticate posturing for extended period of time, that's when I'm saying, ooh, this is, this is not good. It, it's not a 100% mortality at all. But you should be saying to yourself, this is, this is probably the outcome and we gotta get going. He needs all the stuff that we can do. Here's that middle meningeal artery that we talked about. Now we're, we're at the epidural hematoma. And this one, long, ever since, you know, I went to school for this in probably the 70s, they want us to be able to, I'm um, a story problem, be able to say this is more likely a subdural and this is more likely an epidural. You should be ready for that. It absolutely does not make any sense for, you know, like once you're a paramedic, it just doesn't matter, right? We just treat what we see. But this is going to be uh, on quizzes, tests here, and at the National Registry. You need to know that an epidural is an arterial bleed. There's your number one culprit is the middle meningeal artery. And since that happens, it usually is a, res a blow to the head that results in a loss of consciousness. It's kind of like that's the normal story. So National Registry, it should be a story that that hit was bad enough to get knocked out. So. I didn't give myself an arterial bleed there. All right, it was bad enough to where they got knocked out. It doesn't have to be any, had to be at least 30 seconds or one minute. It's just bad enough to get knocked out. And then they are talking after that. All right, so they're up. And this is very often then the reason that we all have to know it is, yeah, he probably just got concussed. All right, and then we let them sign an AMA and leave them there. And then a half hour later, 20, uh, we will, for this one, think of it as 30 minutes to two hours. Somewhere in there, they have a steep decline in their LOC, a steep increase in all those bad signs that we saw before. Uh, and then we're going to compare this to a subdural. Which one do you think has a higher mortality rate, an epidural or a subdural? So, subdural. Epidural is arterial bleed. What do you think? But you're, subdural. if it's subdural, you don't notice it as much. Subdural, then it has more space. Yeah. If it's epidural, the mom's protecting you. The mom is protecting you. So okay. they that. Epidurals you, uh, don't have as high mortality rate mm -hmm. because they get uh, bad so rapidly, people immediately call. <laughs> And they end up in in like it's like it's that 17 year old who actually like ah, I didn't go to the hospital and then now they're like well we have to watch you <laughs> and then as soon as they get back boop, they go to the hospital it's an easy one to find easy one for them subdural can be kind of a cult sometimes so uh, when we talk about uh, alcoholism and geriatrics that those are big subdural ones all right as the brain gets a little smaller 
is able to move around more. It's easier to tear veins compared to arteries. And they very often, the, uh, it's you know like the perfect scenario is the transient person who's an alcoholic who has low vitamin K, um, multiple subdural hematomas. Burp, burp, burp. Look at what I can do with PowerPoint. Subdural, I think we covered that then. Venous, acute and chronic. I think there's a subacute also. So uh, the one thing that I do think is important is uh, an acute subdural hematoma can look exactly like an epidural bleed. All right? You, you won't know the difference. It, it can look exactly like the other. A chronic is the ones where we're talking more about those geriatrics and the alcoholism, where they can, when the medical examiner finally gets to them, they say, oh, you've had like eight bleeds that have been bleeding over the last few months. You have a bunch of clots here, some that are still bleeding a little bit, and one here, this is the one that actually killed you. So, and then here's an intracerebral hematoma. And now we have bleeding within the brain tissue. The patient can deteriorate quickly, very often has a headache. Um, the, uh, we associate this with uh, stroke things also. Looks like a stroke. Um, with this, I believe that with this one more than the others, this one the pupil will look at, will look towards the bad place, all right? So when you look, they'll have a disconjugate gaze. No, disconjugate is like that. So a conjugate gaze towards the bleed. Anybody might have that wrong. Doesn't matter to us, right? But they, uh, that's this one, not not as much on the epi and subdural. And this one isn't like, this one's probably not the answer in the National Registry. It's almost always epidural subdural, all right? And was there one more subarachnoid? And so bleeding and then uh, severe headache. It's below the arachnoid. There's no, this is a subdural, right? It's subdural bleed. It's below the dura. So really, there's no reason for us to really talk about this one. <laughs> Sorry to say. I don't mean to give it known. But uh, if subdural isn't, if it's really sound like a subdural and subdural is not one of the answers, it's just below the arachnoid layer. Uh, they come up with a severe headache there. That one is another one where, the, where it has this conjugate gaze and the pupils will work, work, look towards the problem. Management always makes sense. Uh, stuff that we've all, we've known all of this, get their airway, hopefully. Um, and then it's the blood pressure above 90. If you go to ITLS, it's 110. The 110 totally makes sense, all right? You want to make sure that they have a blood pressure because their ICP is increasing. Um, their MAP is going to need to increase. A, a blood pressure of 90 systolic isn't really helpful when they have an ICP of 30 or 40. At some point, and this is the tricky point, at some point we hyperventilate. More than likely, the answer on the National Registry is we don't hyperventilate. We hyperventilate once they're herniating, once we have the blown pupil, altered LOC, seizure activity with that posture. Then we say to ourselves, all right, it's time to hyperventilate. How do we know we're hyperventilating? Like, what is our, what's our instruction for hyperventilating? What's that? And then end title does what? It keep track of respirations and the amount of carbon dioxide that's being used. It drops. Good. So where do we want their end title to be? Under 30. 34. Yeah. So we want it under 35. 34 is under 35. So they don't want it to be 12. All right. So we don't go aggressive. It's hyperventilation. The best way for us is going to be that. All right. The other number for PHTLS is a a rate of 20. So in the absence of entitled CO2, it's a rate of 20. When we have entitled CO2, which we should, then it's 34 or below 35. And it's absolutely not like as low, as low a number as we can get. We'll be harming the patient. Well, Steve, I got him down to one. <laughs> All right, so here we are back at the vertebrae. You guys don't need to know those things. Um, and you get the sweet knowledge that we talked about a little bit ago. Boom. 
enter your poster. And here is like a little bit more of the pointing out that you have gray matter and white matter there, a central canal. We have uh, vessels on the inside there that are going to feed your spinal cord. Those things can be infringed upon by trauma. Again, the dura, arachnoid and PLF matter are all there. Do you guys remember this much from preparatory? We would have talked about it. <clears throat> These are the different tracks. So we have that dorsal column. Any ideas? What does our what what is that responsible for? What's its duty? What's that? Nope. Nope. Anyone? And then there's the spinal thalamic. Remember how we taught this? Was it says spine? And then the thalamic, like hypothalamus, so it sounds like the brain. So it's spine and then brain. So it's, again, not motor. <laughs> but if we go down to here, cortico, that sounds brainish, right? Corticospinal, going from brain to spine, that's your motor there. So these tracks, this isn't just made up. I used to never pay any attention to this. I was like, they don't know what happened, on what's going on here. But... There is predictive like we need to know the AMP, so it's easy when we get to the different cord syndromes later on. The dorsal column, you guys remember what I said to use to remember this one? Here it is here. Boop. A dorsal fin. All right, the dorsal fin. A dorsal fin of a shark. Fin is fine. So what this picks up is then fine motor movement. You know, fine, I shouldn't say fine motor movement, fine movement, um, fine touch, proprioception, vibration. Remember, vibration, a shark can sense vibration in the water from a long ways away. So, uh, and then proprioception, you just have to kind of remember. Proprioception, again, is like our understanding of where we are in space. So our brain is always interpreting, like, I have so much pressure on the outside of my foot here, or that there's so much pressure in between my finger and my thumb right now. Um, that's all picked up by this different kind of nerves, goes to our spinal cord, and up our spinal cord to the brain on a certain track that they can predict this is the track this is where the track is spinal thalamic the trick to remember do you guys remember any of that it's a pain in your spine <laughs> pain and then you have to realize that pain is um is associated with cold um, so the spine first just like i said earlier Spine goes to the brain, so it's going to be afferent. And so now we need to go back to those words too. Afferent goes towards the brain. Efferent exits the brain. And so here we have pain and temperature regulation. The other thing that's kind of neat about spinal thalamic is we usually talk about stuff crossing in the brain. Right? It crosses in the brain. Right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, right? We said that over and over and over again. And that is true here. Um, that's, this is my left side, right? So the left, when I go like this. So the right side of my brain controls this, right? It's the same thing with the reception, since we're on the sensory side. The way that that works, though, is it drops straight down out of my brain. All right, I shouldn't say out of my brain, it goes straight up to my brain when it's in the central nervous system, but it crosses there. All right, so that another way to do that is pain in your spine will make you cross. All right, like in a bad mood, cross. So we cross here. So what that means then is our dorsal didn't do that. Our dorsal crossed in our brain went straight down all right it crosses just above the the brain stem there's your pain in your spine makes you cross 
And then the corticospinal is, a, is the worst <laughs> because it has actually both. But we can, again, kind of go with it crosses. 90%, all the somatic ones, the things that really are important to us, they cross uh, in the brain and go straight down. They don't cross in the body, cross over to the other side of the body. So corticospinal, remember cortex is part of your brain, spine is spine, so it's going to be motor, efferent. And then some myotomes, all right? So I have to make trauma hard, so you have to know your myotomes to some degree. Um, if you remember, we talked about this a, a, a bit. Um, here we have C3 through C5. It goes down to the diaphragm. What nerve is that? Phrenic. The phrenic nerve. All right. So C5 is your elbow flexors, biceps, brachialis. So these are uh, myotomes, muscles, right? So there's dermatomes and myotomes. So C3 through C5, all about movement, right? All about that motor side. And so elbow flexor, so this is, if you can do this, your C5 is intact. C6 is wrist extensors. C7, elbow extensors. C6 is fingers flexors. And then T1, uh, hand intrinsic, blah, 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 small finger. I like to think of that way up here. And then when she gets into the T's, I think T's, you can think of them as breathing ones, all right? Intercostal kind of things. So here's a guy doing the thing. So C5, you're flexing the elbow, just like I showed. Boom, you can do this. This is it. Not this, just this, all right? So this is C5. His C5 is intact. If, his, if he's broken, uh, go to here, <laughs> C7. See, we skip there. A little trick there. There's a C6 that we're missing there. C5, C6, C7. Now we're broken. We're, I don't want to confuse you, but we're broken at C6, so C7's broken. Right? Make, make sense, everybody? So you can't do this, though. So the person does this, and then he's done. <laughs> End of the test. He can't do that. All right? Then you know your damage is at C6, and you don't have C7. Uh, at C6, you can extend your wrist. Uh, C8, uh, oh, C6, and then uh, T1 is the keeping the fingers apart, and then uh, T1 is abducting. Let's go all the, let's just see if we have a C8 here. Try to keep the finger straight, and the patient tries to flex, remember from the slide before. So here is C8. I just don't have a good picture for it. All right, C6. And then uh, the T's are when you're adducting and abducting your fingers. This is it. And so when you uh, remember where we're most vulnerable for our spinal cord is our C-spine, right? You have a big old heavy head on kind of the weaker muscles, smaller smaller spine, smaller area. That's where it is. It's thor thoracic. You don't see a lot of thoracic trauma, you know, spinal trauma. And then there's lumbar trauma, and you get that from falling and landing on your feet, and then you're like at L2 and L3 will come apart, three, three and four. Um, so when we're doing that nexus survey or the main state protocol, we're trying to figure out if the person has an intact C-spine. T1 is just below. Remember, how many cervical vertebrae are there? Go. Seven. Seven. But I have a C8 here. What's that? It's because we have a nerve that comes out before C1. So all the way before T1, we have a C8. All right. And then when we are, when we want to say, boom, the cervical spine is intact, you just have to go spread your fingers and close your fingers against some pressure. Boom, your cervical spine is intact. Make sense? On both, you can do that on both sides. For me, I have a pitch on this side. This is weak. This is noticeably weaker than this side. All right, um, and that's because that's where it's, where the, the problem is at. It just has to be about that. Um, then these myotomes. Guess what? I don't care about them hardly at all. All right, you're not going to see them in quizzes or tests. Probably doesn't make that big of a difference. 
later on we'll, we'll talk about it just a little bit again when we're talking about the cauda equina all right when we uh, have a nice picture of our spinal cord do we got a spinal cord one here the oh. end is cauda equina right yeah. so the horse's hair and that starts at around l2 lumbar 2. so a lot of times we talk about that as being the true cord the true cord stops at around lumbar 2 where the wrong answer is going to be sacral and lumbar 5 all right those are the wrong air long wrong ones so a lot of times when you do have new nerve root problems here you'll have one-sided problem because it's the the horses were in the horse's hair already. And here's the way you can uh, test them. Again, like when we look at these things here where the L2, they flex the hips and L3 extends the knees. Um, this, these are just hard to remember. I think they're hard to remember and they're hard to do these tests, all right? Um, when, we're, when we're working as paramedics and such, it's, it's, you're like, well, why do that? When we can go down here and do a push on the accelerator, pull up, uh, and then we know those are intact. <laughs> so we just go to the this push, pull, you're good to go. Uh, and then you know that S1 is intact. Dermatomes then, when you do the dermatomes, the easy way to go here is just the, um, for C5, that's five. All right, so if you go five, and then you're going to go down here, uh, six, six is here, right? Thumb, six, seven, eight, T, T1. All right, so five, this is anatomical man. So five, six, seven, eight, T1. All right, that's what that says. So all you have to do is go five. Number five, you know how to count. Six, seven, eight, T1. All right. I don't think they're gonna make a big deal out of this, all right? What I just used was the one that was by the American Spinal Cord Institute, AFCI. <laughs> so the, uh, which follows what this says, right? It says just the little finger, C, so C7 includes the middle finger, but then C8 is here. Um, when if you just Google it, we all Googled it and hit images, we all pick up different images, we'd get different data. All right. Just a little bit. So that's probably not there. I I think it's neat, but again, if you can tell that T1 is intact, you don't have to do any of the other tests. All right. That that's just a motor sign. So here, when we're at T4, is can you feel that? <laughs> so this is just feeling. This isn't movement, right? Dermatome is feeling. Really good questions, though. All right, really good questions. And from the National Registry, that's going to be like if you want to, if you're in charge of writing the hard questions, it's going to be the person who's able to feel this and not feel that. Where's his break? Where's the problem? Where's the tumor? Where's the fracture? Where's the whatever it would be? You're getting those questions. You're get, you're, you should be happy. All right, like psh. we're happy now. We're getting hard questions. And then T4, remember that nipple line. That's that's easy stuff. That's definitely National Registry stuff. And T10, umbilicus, definitely. All right, 100%. That those those would be in there. But now when we get lower, like the inguinal inguinal line, which is like this, um, the anterior thigh, medial. I don't care about those near as much. Here's another look at it where you can see that C5, 6. And again, you can. Uh, one thing that this brings up is this is um, trigeminal. So you have three different things here. When we're up here, um, we're very much uh, cranial nerves. All right, very much cranial nerves. The uh, and but look at that C2 and C3 are there. All right. Um, not myotomes there's there's not muscles moving around that much it's all like right up here we don't like moving this muscle and these would be then your facial right uh, cranial nerve seven movement of your face myotomes that was dermatomes um and then spinal cord injuries how do you how do you injure them you can flex it flexion is going to be this way right so flexion 
Something that is a little bit weird is there's also uh, compression. What, how do you vertically, vertically compress? What does that look like? Uh, the, it travels up and it compresses the lumbar or the thoracic, right? Yeah. How else could you think of a vertical compression? How do you vertically compress your spine? Like if you jump down from a height. That... And how do you land? On your feet, hopefully, or if you land well, on your tailbone. Well, that's exactly what Rebecca already said. Oh, I didn't, I didn't hear head. you. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, so vertical compression and flexion often go together. All right, so when you come up out of your seat and hit the windshield, you vertically compute that oh, compression, okay. right? So your compression this way, and you also flex down, all right? So when you jump into the pool the wrong way, you can flex and crush your, your cervical spine together. And you guys are completely right. When you jump out of a tree, land on hing, it indirectly will get your lumbar, and at some point in the lumbar, I like to say lumbar three, is where you'll, where you, where you'll have a problem. Would you agree with that, Andrew? <laughs> so flexion, boom, and then rotation, that's Steven Seagal kind of stuff, and then vertical compression, and then there's hyperextension and distraction kind of go together. And that's a hanging, all right? So now we're hanging from something. We have that primary and uh, secondary injuries again, and the same thing here, we have ischemic is the only thing that is underneath that, but that could then, that's the same as hypoxic, right? And it could be low blood flow, all right? So it could be hypotension, but it's probably not. Hypotension is a bigger one on the brain rather than here, but it could be just poor perfusion, and I think of poor perfusion and low blood pressure together, but um, that's because of the injury. We don't have good blood flow. Boom, we're going to have further injury later, all right? spinal shock and neurogenic shock. So does anybody know, like, what do you think the difference is between spinal shock and neurogenic shock? Spinal shock is when you have a spinal shock maybe is directly with your spinal cord, like do you have like severed those connections? No, uh, spinal shock, and this is from our thing, it's probably a bad thing to Google. <laughs> You can, but spinal shock, I think our book says it the right way. So spinal shock is um, you, it's like you can cuss them. You hit it and now it stopped working. So the, a lot of the, uh, the last few years we've seen football, professional football players, they can cuss their spinal cord, all right? They have spinal shock, they drop like a sack of potatoes and they get better within 24 hours. Right? They just have this bad hit, they have some edema, but they work between uh, hypothermic, you know, like uh, ice therapy, cryogenic therapy, and corticosteroids, they do better, all right? And with spinal shock, then there isn't a permanent, so transient goes with spinal shock. I like using the term concussion there, probably not that the best thing to use, but it's like you concussed your cord and it's not working for a while, but you get better uh, with good management. The thing is that that shock, and you don't have good, you know, first world medicine kind of treatment, that's going to lead to edema, and then you're going to have secondary cord injuries, right? But we now pretty aggressively treat these, um, and, and people do better, like we heard from Mike Gutley, which was 20 years ago probably, to just, I think last year we had it with somebody. Uh, Got back, boop, got like a sack of potatoes and got better. I'm not talking about the guy who died. <laughs> Remember that? Remember that, Matt? Before um, Tomoshio Cordis. And then neurogenic shock is a transaction of your cord. All right? Neurogenic shock is more likely like we transacted the cord. For you to have neurogenic shock, so what are the signs, what are the vital signs with neurogenic shock? That would have been awesome. If I would have said, what's Cushing's sign? No. Boom, you would have nailed that. <laughs> what do you think the pulse rate is? 
this, um, yeah, I'm going to go, I like to say normal, but Brady is a great answer. So we'll put normal and Brady, all right? And then what is the blood pressure when we talk about shock? Rhymes with O. Low. Yep, good job. And then the respiratory, what would be predictable about respiratory and neurogenic shock? A, pre a predictable consequence. Associated uh, it could different one. They'd be more likely to have like a regular breathing. Like um, regular breathing. It's going yeah. to be decreased time level. All right, and possibly slow. So the uh, now what causes neurogenic shock? Band section of the spinal cord. So now we have to go further. Uh, where is our cord transect? Cervical. All right. So why do you say cervical? Because now we just have parasympathetic. Why don't we have sympathetic? Well, sort of. Our sympathetic nervous system uses our spinal cord, and our parasympathetic nervous system generally doesn't use our spinal cord. We also can't talk to our renal gland, our adrenaline, because we use the nervous system, we use the thoracic nervous system to do that. So it really has to be cervical or high thoracic. If you're not cervical or high thoracic, you don't have it. So if you cut it at T10, you don't have neurogenic shock. Can be paralyzed, all right? But your brain can still talk to your adrenaline, your adrenal glands, and so you'll be able to get adre adrenaline. You'll be able to use your nervous system to say vasoconstrict, right? One thing that I think it's hard for me to wrap my head around is our nervous system without adrenaline is able to talk to all of our vessels and say vasoconstrict, vasodilate. And not only can it do it, it's always doing it. Right now, for all of us, our brain is saying, vessels stay at this, vessels stay at this. In general, vessels stay at this, vessels stay at this, vessels stay at this, vessels stay at this, vessels stay at this. And so our, let's say for the, the big part of our body, our vessels are staying like this, and we'll give this the number five, all right? And it is staying there because we have circulating hormones from adrenaline. We always have adrenaline. All right, then sometimes we have a sympathetic tone that's more adrenaline. What else? What else? How else do we control our blood vessel size? The what? ABH is going to control the amount of salt. But when we get down to the renal system, we do have. Oh, it seems like the kidney releases something that turns into this and turns into that. Mm -hmm. Renin. So we also have the renin system, which angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2. So that's saying stay at 5. And on top of that, we have a nervous system saying, let's stay, let's stay in here. Now, not every second, not every little square millimeter. But in general, it's saying, let's stay at this. It's not down to the microcirculation. It's before that. All right, our brain, our adrenaline, a little bit of parasympathetic nervous system, other hormones are all saying bye, 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 bye. Always, right? As soon as we transect our cord, these guys are like, woohoo, no boss, nobody. So they go to 10, all right? We, we have the ability to make them one, all right, with the sympathetic nervous system. We lost that ability now. And now we're not telling them what to do at all, all right? So our vessels are going to get big. Our container just got big, so our blood pressure goes down. Blood pressure goes down. Baroreceptors notice it, send a message to the brain, and say, hey, let's do something about this. we got low blood pressure. The brain is going to push the sympathetic nervous system, and it goes nowhere, 
It only goes down to C5, let's say. So if it's at C5, we might have the phrenic nerve intact and we'll be breathing with our diaphragm. Then if we're only breathing with our diaphragm and not our thoracic stuff, we're going to have a decreased tidal volume. If we have a higher C-spine, C3, we're not breathing at all, right? No breathing. When we just say, if we say to ourselves, let's breathe faster. I feel like I should be breathing faster. And this is intact, it will be intact. But adrenaline causes us to breathe faster. And we don't have adrenaline. So we could breathe faster if our brain is saying, and we have intact C5, we're below C5, and our brain is saying, uh, let's breathe faster, all right? We're trying adrenaline, that's going nowhere. But we're saying to ourselves, this hurts, so, and I'm, I'm going to breathe faster, all right? We have those nerves intact, we don't have the adrenaline to support it, good? So we may breathe fast for a while, and we may tire out and stop and then when we're done with that, we don't have adrenaline to, to, to give us anything later on. So neurogenic shock. Good? The other thing is, that happens is what does our color look like? Shock. Yeah. Yeah. That would be good if we had a, adrenaline, but we don't have adrenaline. So now we have normal color. All right? And so what they very often will lead to, which is actually rare, is some people will have um, good perfusion. Um, let me see, where is the good perfusion? Up or down? It's, what? It's good. Just... Yeah, uh, I should say not good perfusion, but the normal color, right? So normal color where you can't communicate, you're not causing those things to happen, oh. right? But where you can communicate still, you could give yourself some pallor. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But you'll be doing that with the absence of adrenaline. All right. So that actually goes away. <laughs> so the, uh, does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. If you got adrenaline, then you got adrenaline that works everywhere. All right. If you're using your nervous system, your nervous system will work only where your nervous system can get to it. So that whole <laughs> idea is kind of don't depend on that as being, I need to see this sign or symptom to get neurogenic shock because it's actually kind of rare that that, that would occur. Um, so I guess I'm a little bit, I was a little bit confused because like if you have neurogenic shock and you have anarchy where it goes from five to 10, everybody vasodilates and our blood pressure drops, we're not going to see that clinically because we don't have adrenaline telling the paleness to happen. Does that make sense? So you don't get pale, you get normal. So you, that will give you normal. normal. You'll still have normal, okay. Yeah, it's, and you could okay. say that, like some people will say flush, but I don't like to say that. Okay. Like we're vasodilating, but we have, also have a really low blood pressure. Right. So I don't like to say flushed. So I just say normal color. Okay. Normal color where the problem is. Okay. Where you still can communicate, you 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 have vasoconstriction and okay. paler. Okay. So um, what do we do, you think? For those spinal cord injuries, what do we do? Bring them to the hospital. All right. So if it's neuro, if it's a spinal cord injury, we it's called to mobilize them on a backboard with a seat collar. Everybody good with that? Lots of padding. Neurogenic shock. We try to fill the container with water. All right. So you give them two liters of fluid. Uh, Pre-hospital, I do not see you giving dopamine to this patient or levofed, but that is what the person needs: is levofed, which is pure alpha dopamine at high doses. So that isn't going to be something that I expect you to do. But as a paramedic student, you need to know the theory that when you have neurogenic shock, dopamine at high doses or levofed is what would be needed. All right? It is in the it is in the national registry. To me it's totally not reality. You would be filling the container with water and bringing them to the hospital and letting them take care of it. It really has to be isolated because we're not supposed to give those drugs in the presence of hypovolemia. You're giving to somebody with a low blood pressure, you truly have to rule out hypovolemia. I've had one person with a neurogenic shock, a small adult, like a 17 year old, not an adult, right? Um, 
who got ran over by it was uh, this time of year, like a little, little in a little while. Anyways, got ran over by a a um, hay uh, like he was on a hayride. They got ran over, and then um, he had all of these kind of things. And uh, uh, I shouldn't say he had all these kind of things. He had uh, C spine boom, and his blood pressure was fine. <laughs> so he, he definitely the like. Uh, transected, everything is seen boop, 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 but his pulse was was not fast, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't, wasn't 40, <laughs> it was probably in the 60s or 70s, and his blood pressure, he was perfusing his brain fine. It, it was like 110 or something like that. So it was lower, but definitely adequate enough, nothing that you had to treat. I, and, uh, you know, I talked to people, and I've never had anybody who really had all, a perfect neurogenic shock. They, they, they occur, I'm sure they occur, <laughs> but I think it's kind of rare. Um, and I think if we have them, or if they have a long time, it's a time thing. We just get them to the hospital before we start seeing them. So here is the Nexus survey, Main Street protocol, um, the rule out, or what, 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 what do we call this when we say, all right, we're not gonna mobilize you. Decision tree. This is a decision tree for not immobilizing somebody, <laughs> All right? Rule out immobilization. I think that's what it is, right? So the first, the, the first thing we have to say is to get on here, we have a mechanism, all right? So we're not on this slide at all if there's no mechanism. It's a medical patient, all right, whatever it would be. So to get on here, we first have a mechanism, and here, noticeably, this is for blunt trauma, not a, a gunshot wound. If they have an alternative level of consciousness, we, we get to them, we immobilize them. See collar and backboard. They had, do not have an altered level of consciousness. We say, do you have pain? All right. And then check for tenderness. All right. So pain and tenderness, that's different. Pain is, they just say, um, you just say, does anything hurt? And they say, yeah, my neck hurts. Yes, my back hurts. Tenderness is, how about when I push on it? You're eliciting pain. That's tenderness. So everybody good? First step, do you hurt? Second, how about here, 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 all the way down the spine. The next is deficits and complaints. And we can probably do this simultaneously. We're going to say, do you have any numbness or tingling? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Move this, move this, move this, move this. All right? So the way I think to do these then when we're checking the uppers is right here. All right? Move against, um, keep your fingers separated and see if I can push them together. Now separate them. And we've, we said T1 is intact if we did that. All right? So now we got it down to T1. And then we go down to the, then we might as well say, can you feel this? Can you feel this? Remember, the way they want us to do this is to check all of the tracks, too. If we're going like this, can you feel this? This is the dorsal track. Can you feel this? This is the spinal phallic. All right? So this is pain. All right? And this is light touch. All right? So that's checking those. I really don't care about those that much. All right. So I think you say, can, can you feel this? Can you feel this? It seems like what uh, Dr. Chassie is okay with us doing that. Dr. Chassie wants us checking proprioception or light touch and pain. All right. And so most people think of that as soft and pointy, <laughs> whatever you use, uh, side of the pen or the thing. They say also, you know, check it here. This is the side and this is the pointy. Is this pointy or is this side? Can you feel this is basically what you're saying. Um, and you do that here, here, move, here, here, move, or you're checking motor. Down there, it's push and pulls. Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Everybody good with that? And so that is neurological deficit and complaint. Deformity of the spine, you checked when you're checking with the tenderness, right? So you went down the spine. Does this hurt? 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 So when they are no, no, and no, um, now you're going to talk more about the concerning MOI. But here, if any of those were yes, you're going to mobilize them. As we go here, 
It says, what is the concerning mechanism of injury? So uh, what do you guys think? I don't think I have a slide for what this is. Oh, here it is. A violent impact to the head, neck, and torso and pelvis. That might just get you to say, ah, all right, let's just mobilize them. All right. Absolutely not the protocol around here, right? So uh, sudden acceleration and deceleration, bending forces, falls, this basically falls from height. Ejection out of the vehicle, shallow water, uh, diving accident. So when you have those, you say, no, there isn't any of those. Um, then you can say, boom, you're good to go. All right. But that when it is concerning, you know, you're, you, you really got on the page because you were concerned, right? So this is kind of a little bit weird. We could just have the decision train keep on going from the other slide. It's the alcohol and drugs in a way that would impact them feeling pain, all right? This isn't, oh, you had a beer four hours ago? Boom, get on the backboard. Distracting injury, I think, is super subjective also. Is that how it's written? Alcohol, 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 alcohol. We had some time. There was a debate about this. How is it, like you stated, if it takes away your ability to feel pain? Or how, how is it written to decide to? It's a good thing to look if you're talking about protocol. It, it, that's where it stemmed from because somebody wanted them because they had, they admitted to a history of it hours ago, like the one beer, yeah. two beers. So, and then that's, they wanted to go down that route where with the rest of us, like common sense and we're like, okay. To me, it is like what we're doing, what. You just have to throw your common sense in there, kind of thing. So it says alcohol or drugs, and you say, oh, you're on an ACE inhibitor? Get on the backboard, because they they're not going to list, like, cocaine and all of these. Like, those, uh, it's all of the ones that are, you know, analgesias, and, you know, all of those are the ones that we'd be into, and that you have to throw common sense into there. So distracting injury is another one. So distracting injury is a, a painful injury. So I think... A good provider can talk people through painful injuries. So you treat the painful injury while you're holding C-spine. Then you're done with that. You can't give them morphine and then say, so does your spine hurt? <laughs> so it's before you start giving drugs. But you can say, all right, I want you to forget about your laceration, your broken foot, or whatever it is. Some things are to be, you know, like a, a degloving of your lower leg. <laughs> you know, you're like, nah, you're getting mobilized, all right? You're not going to be able to feel when I'm playing with your spine. So, but you can talk through people some distracting injuries. Everybody good with that? Like a sprained ankle and things of that sort. You say, all right, I want you to forget about that pain. I need you to really concentrate now. Does your neck hurt? And do this. Does your back hurt? Do this. And then inability to communicate is maybe drugs and alcohol, but it could also be, you know, the patient doesn't want to, or the person doesn't speak English. And I don't speak other languages very good. Um, so they have those, you're immobilizing them. And then here you say, no, 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 immobilization is not indicated. Everybody good? And this is a national registry question. Kid gets hit by, uh, gets hit while he's on a bicycle by a car. All right. He has a fractured lower leg. He was, uh, it's low impact. All right. So. Low impact car, at, at the, they describe it like while the car was turning from a stop, stop, you know, he was stopped, now he turned, hit the kid on the bike, and he has a broken leg. Uh, do you have to immobilize? All right. Uh, and I, po I chose no. I chose uh, treat the fracture and put him on a stretcher. All right. Ultimately, that was the, the thing. I don't know what the answer was, but I did pretty good on it. I passed. That was that, and that was a couple times ago. And then here, distracting injuries. Those all kind of make sense, right? Fractures, visceral injury, deglovings, burns, all of those. But truly, a good provider can talk people through some of those. And so, everybody good with that? That was all blunt. Penetrating trauma. Is there a neurological deficit or complaint? No, immobilization is not indicated, all right? So this is absolutely fodder for National Registry, all right? And we talked about this a bit. I would think we talked about this. <laughs> so when people are shot and we lay them down, 
they do worse. All right? When people are shot, when in the past, it was always everybody was shot. Well, that bullet passed through, there's that cavitation, the uh, permanent cavity and the temporary cavity, and you can draw a bone across there, and if you're going to shatter your spine. Absolutely can happen. Does that make sense? Absolutely, a bullet can go through your spinal cord. When a bullet goes through your spinal cord, you will have neurological deficit. Make sense? When you get to the patient who's been shot in the chest seven times, up and down the chest and back, when you get there and he's still talking to you, he's smoking a cigarette, saying, I can't believe they got me seven times. Um, if he doesn't have any neurological complaints, pain on the pain, uh, I would think that goes with pain down the cord and blah, 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 four, um, you don't immobilize him. All right? If they do have that, then we immobilize them. And I think an altered level of consciousness goes with immobilization, too. That's a neurological deficit, right? Altered level of consciousness. Unstable spinal fractures from penetrating trauma are extremely rare. So this is research, all right? It can happen. It definitely can happen. That might be, uh, I don't have any cases. <laughs> I know that I immobilize, oops. Uh, we, I fully immobilize a lot of shootings, all right? Um, and, not, and I think that some of those shootings might not have survived because of that, all right? Because they don't breathe as well, and their airway is going to be easier and easier to compromise, harder to control, all right? So let them sit, sit up if they can. Determining the level of injury. Uh, the level, uh, your motor level is the last level with good function. So, like, if they're doing this, do you guys remember where, what was intact for me to do this? C6. C5, right? C5. Sensory, then, would be here. He's good at C5. Here we go. 25-year-old male fell off a roof, intubated at the scene by EMS, because that's what we do. Consciousness regained, could not move arms or legs, could close and open his eyes on command, not able to breathe by himself, totally dependent on the BBM. Where is his cervical spine fracture? What's that? Above C5. Any, any further north than that? Well, if he can't breathe by himself, isn't it C? C3, right? So C3, 4, and 5 is where the freeman comes off like this. So um, the, uh, here's your answer, I think, for the level of injury, and C3 and above. All right? Everybody good with that? We can do it again. Here we go. So a 19-year-old white male, it's important, white, I guess, <laughs> diving accident, no loss of consciousness, could not understand why he could not move his legs, his forearms, and hands. He can shrug his shoulder and elevate his arms. Uh, what nerve is, makes this impact? I don't know. What's that? Shrug your shoulder. Say it, and we're out of here early. Spinal accessory. We're out of here early. So his blood pressure is low, heart rate is, what, what, um, what do we call that? Lows, do this. Let's do one way. Neurogenic shock, right? So had difficulties breathing, required intubation later. Where do you think this is? C3 to C5. I was wondering if it was going to have another little pop up box. Varying degrees of, the, of diaphragm dysfunction is going to be right there then, because that's where the phrenic nerve comes off, C3 to 5. And usually it'll need ventilatory assistance at some point. It's high like that, so they're going to have the neurogenic shock. Seems good for that mechanism also. What is the difference between spinal shock and neurogenic shock? I think we got that earlier, right? So temporary for spinal shock, hypotension and bradycardia with neurogenic shock. Um, this one, I uh, erased the thing. So a lower cervical is uh, C6 to T1. So this guy was able to breathe the, the whole time, um, but he is going to have a low 
tidal volume, all right? So at some point, they get intubated also, usually in the hospital. 22-year-old Hispanic female. Is that you? <laughs> Motor vehicle accident, hit a pole and rolled over, positive ETOH, positive THC, short-term loss of consciousness, not able to move her legs, no problem with the upper extremities, no feeling in the lower extremities, no bladder or bowel control, and the sensory level is at the umbilicus. So sensory level at the umbilicus, so she can feel here. What do you think? T10. T10. Seems like that makes sense, right? Yeah. How about this one, a 22-year-old white? That would be Michaela. Motor vehicle accident, not able to feel her legs below the knee, could flex the thigh against gravity, no bladder or bowel, sensory level above the knee on the left side and below on the right side. This is a syndrome. What syndrome would this be? Horse's tail syndrome. So that's cauda acquired below L2. All right, so. The, the thing that leads you to cauda equina is they're different on the different legs, all right? Because they're now we're in the horse's tail, so they'll affect the one side versus the other differently. Transient concussion, kind of what we talk about with spinal shock. A contusion kind of makes sense. It's going to a contusion is one of those things that we in first world medicine can do a lot for. It shouldn't be a long-term thing. They can be lacerated, compressed, you know, complete transection. We can have hemorrhages, all right? From a blunt trauma, you can have a hemorrhagic problem that leads to poor circulation, and you can have all the bad things that we associate with transection of the cord is usually what we're thinking. All of those are secondary things, then ischemia, hypoxia, edema, hemorrhagic lesions, all of those things were those secondary injuries. So here's the spinal cord syndromes. And this, again, when we're at the National Registry, we'd be going, woohoo, I'm getting hard questions. All right, if they're asking these questions, I think that they're going to recognize these as hard questions. Central cord syndrome is going to be a problem in the, what part of the cord, Tyler? The central. central. Yeah, that's the central part. So it's going to be here, and that's a vascular problem. All right. So this is that you don't know this. It's just that's what it is. It's a vascular problem. Something that's kind of cool is look at this. Uh, our upper limbs are more important than the lower limbs for our survival. So this is more medial, more inside, more protected. So upper and then our trunk, and then our lower limbs are the farthest away from central. So with central cord, um, the patient has a total loss. You know, I like to just say drops like a sack of potatoes. But then he regains his legs, and that might happen in a way that we see that he's saying now, I've lost, I can't use my arms, but I can use my feel anyways with my legs now, and maybe I have weakness with my legs but they're better than his arms. And it doesn't make sense to us. It's like, it doesn't make sense that you can use your arms and not your legs, all right? It's usually, if you transect up here, it's arms and legs, you transect it here, it's just your legs and your arms are fine. So here, it's up here again, it's covering both arms and legs, and he ends up with, um, let's go, since this is up already, it says central cord syndrome is sacral sparing. I didn't make that up. <laughs> Very often when you when you uh, read definitions of this, it will say it's sacral sparing. It spares the sacral. All right, so the legs are spared. Central cord syndrome is sacral sparing. Central cord syndrome is sacral sparing. Central cord syndrome is sacral sparing. All you have to do is say it three times in your head. You don't have to say it out loud. Then you always get it. All right, so what happened is this is it's a bleeding thing from the central cord and that blood then affects the upper because they're supposed to be the more protected. This is the most, no, this is fairly rare, 
all right? Um, and, and like I had in a probably three paramedic classes ago, one of the students, he's a life medic in New Ego now, worked at the place next to St. Mary's is called Mary 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 <laughs> oh. on this award. And he's like, oh, we, don't, we don't have any else. <laughs> like, it, it was super rare. And he said, yeah. so the other ones can be more rare. And I don't think that that makes a big of a difference. But this one truly is a great national registry thing. See, it's in central core syndrome is sacral sparing because it might be like the person's faking. All right. That would be another wrong answer has to be this. So he's probably faking. Brown Saccard. All right. Brown Saccard is two names. It's the only one that's going to be. These are two two names. Brown Saccard. And when I was young with sisters, my mom said very often to them because they would go crying to my mom when I would tease them. She would say it always takes two to tango. All right. Brown saccards is a hemi transection of the cord. So you it's almost always knife and gun club kind of stuff. It's from a from getting in a fight. A bullet goes through there, bone shard goes through there from the bullet, or Jackie Chan with a knife goes in there and ninjas him and only gets half of his cord. So it's a hemi section. One half of the cord is assaulted and the other half is intact. And as we remember, that corticospinal, what did the corticospinal do for us? What does that track do for us? What's that? Corticospinal. Radial spine, efferent. Efferent, right? So what's another way to say efferent then? It excites. What's that? It excites. How about motor? So the motor is corticospinal, and that crossed in the brain, went straight down, and then dorsal, yeah. straight down, and, straight down. and then the other one um, went down this way and crossed, this is the midway. <laughs> so, and that last one, you guys, anybody who yeah on what that one was? What is it? It starts with the brain. Spinal thalamic? Spinal thalamic. Spinal thalamic starts with the brain. So it ends with the brain. Spinal thalamic crosses your spine. Pain in your spine will make you cross. That one crosses, so this one gives you uh, weakness and paralysis on one side and loss of sensation on the opposite side. All right? So loss of sensation on the opposite side. The only the, the, the super easy question. You don't have to memorize that stuff as much as you see. Like it was probably an assault, and then he then the way they described the patient is it was different. Like they're going to start thinking talking about weakness on one side and loss of uh, uh, sensation on the opposite side. Oh yeah. All right, we're moving on. Oh, did I, I even explain it with this way? Probably not as pretty as my whiteboard. Mm -hmm. So spinal thalamic, and then the dorsal and the cortical spinal are both that. Way. So here, this was this is going deeper. So don't get too <coughs> wrapped up about this. But contralateral is the opposite side. They're going to have the loss of pain and temperature. The ipsilateral, which is the same side, that's going to have the paralysis, the loss of vibration, the loss of proprioception and light to touch, because that's the track, right? Just like we've seen there, just like we've seen on the previous slide. Oh yeah? So again, I think of the National Registry, this is deeper, this is my test. National Registry is just gonna, it'll be easy because of the assault with this weird thing like this side and this side. Anterior cord, um, so this is anterior cord, anterior, is further away from the back, right? So it's the front of that. An artery problem caused damage to the bone. Artery problem caused by damage to the bone. Loss of function, loss of motor function, loss of pain and temperature, preserved position and light touch. Dorsal is posterior, 
dorsal position in light touch. The dorsal is intact. It's the anterior cord syndrome. Posterior is intact. So what do we have okay? We have the posterior intact. The dorsal column is intact. Anterior cord syndrome. And then posterior cord syndrome is going to be the opposite. This one's the most uncommon one. This one's not in your book, I don't think. So here, but it's going to be the opposite, and it ends up being just your knowledge of anatomy and physiology. That's all this is. So both anterior cord and posterior cord, you know, we're, you shouldn't be like, oh, yeah, I ran three of those the other day. <laughs> you know, that we're not going to see these very often. I've never seen any of those. I've never seen any of the syndromes. Um, I think that they're here. One, it's a testing of your anatomy and physiology. All right, it's a testing of that. They're difficult questions. If you're getting these right, you're going to get neurogenic shock. Correct. On the, on the so injury. would things like that, cent the central cord system, be more likely caused by, like, if somebody gets, I, wonder, I just wonder if it would be like a, somebody gets like an epidural where they're purposely going in and numbing you, would that, I wonder, be like a more likely cause? Maybe, but that's like if they really did it poor because yeah. it's in the central cord and they're with an epidural, they're just getting a right. up. Um, I think that one is known to be associated with medical problems. So they have uh, spondylo spondylosis or something like okay. that. Um, and then they have a traumatic event and then that leads to them having okay. uh, bleeding. Okay. It, it's very odd. Like when I think of it, I think of it as probably something where they have a misformation of the artery, and then the trauma, which you would have you would have been okay with it, but with this person, it caused them to bleed in that area. Okay. 